Father, we thank you that being humble before you is that which you seek. Doesn't matter where we are in our life station. Doesn't matter where we are in a strata of society. But you only look, Father God, into our hearts. You resist the proud and you exalt the humble. So, Father, it is good for us to learn humility. And as we saw in your word, that you're building a humble and a meek people. And it's a reference to the glorious church. That which has been tempered by tests and trials and purified in a furnace until we are pure gold. That which you are bringing forth in our life, Father God, of the glory that you have in store for us. We thank you, Father, and we line our lives with your perfect will. We seek only your perfect will, and we seek to do only all that you ask us to do. We give you all glory, worship, and honor, and we thank you, Father, for all your goodness to our lives. We acknowledge your goodness. We give you thanks and praise. All glory be to you always, forevermore. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. <clears throat> now, it's interesting in the Bible that uh, the Bible speaks about humility and it uses the highest and most powerful people in the Bible to illustrate it, kings. We saw in the illustration, uh, in a story during this series on King Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, then we're going to see uh, many times how God looks at the kings that rule over uh, nations, Israel, Judah, and uh, God continued to promote humility uh, as if that is something that he's always looking for all the time. So we saw how Nebuchadnezzar failed to humble himself and God dealt with him. He suffered seven years of madness until he learned to be humble. And after he was humble, there were changes that were made, I believe, uh, to the kingdom. And Daniel continued to help rule the kingdom until the next kingdom, which was the Middle Persian Empire. If you also notice how the Babylonian Empire ended, it was under uh, a descendant of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. I remember the, the descendant of so-called the son, but actually several layers down. Because uh, things pass from one to the other quite fast. Uh, and uh, what well, the Bible refers to the sun, that uh, they reach a point when uh, in, the, in the book of Daniel, they reach a point when in celebration, he asked to use the gold vessels that are meant for the temple of Israel. And when he, the night that he used a very vessel in his pride, that was the night the Middle Persian Empire conquered him. The handwriting on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel, yifasin. God uses uh, the Bible and the stories in the Bible, which are history for us, to show how he looks for humility. So he brings forth one of the most powerful status, a king, an emperor. And it shows how they need to also humble themselves. And when they humble themselves, good things happen. Now, let's look at um, some of these stories in the Bible. And uh, let's look um, at, we have done Hezekiah, we have done a little bit of David, we have uh, done in Nebuchadnezzar. But let's uh, look at, um, A very interesting place, uh, I would say a whole series of kings, from Hezekiah right down to his grandson. Just look at that range. There are many that we could look at, but we just take that, uh, oops, typing error. The story is found in two places, in Kings, in Second Kings, as well as in... Um, First Chronicles. Let's look at the king's place. Second Kings. Second 
2 Kings, okay, here we go. Right, we have done the story of Hezekiah, and towards the end we know that Hezekiah was blessed by the Lord because he humbled himself. But uh, one of the things that we, we learn is that humility needs to be continued on. But here we see as Hezekiah was beginning his reign, or sometime during his reign, he began to confront problems. And among the problems were the Syrians who have become very powerful, the Assyrians. Look at verse 17, 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 17. It says, Then the king of Assyria sent to the Tatan, uh, Rebsaris, and the Rebshake from Lachish, with a great army against Jerusalem. So here comes the army of the Assyrians that he assembled to King Hezekiah. They went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they come up, they went and stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool and all these other uh, details. Then Rabshakeh says to Hezekiah in a proud manner, Thus says the great king, that is the Assyrian king, king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? You speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away? And said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar. So Hezekiah started and he was a good king. He is telling them, get rid of all those things. Now some of the kings have a hard time. Because um, the kings before them could be a bad king. And then they ruin everything. By the time they take over, it's a ruined kingdom. And then sometimes it's a good king followed by the bad king. And the good king builds everything up, the next king destroys everything. So Israel keep going up and down. In all the kings in Israel were bad, but Judah keep going up and down, up and down with good king, bad king, good king, bad king sometimes. And, uh, but whether the king, kings come and go, but there's one attribute that God looks for. You all know what that is. Humility. Whether a king has this personality or that personality, type A personality, type B, type C personality, doesn't matter. He only looks for a king that is humble. And as long as the king is humble, God bless the king. So we see some of this example. And we look at Hezekiah because there's a little bit of story that we can tell from his life. Uh, he was challenged by this um, uh, Rabshakeh. And uh, they tried to persuade the people not to trust in the Lord. Now when you come to talking about God, that's a different thing. When he challenged him about trusting in Egypt, that's different. But now he's challenging the Israelites' trust in God. He's challenging God. That's a big thing. Uh, and so here comes all the challenge and the words. Uh, the people held their peace. Uh, look at what Hezekiah did. Verse 1, chapter 19, first, uh, Second Kings. When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, went into the house of God, and didn't want to come up. He just humbled himself and went in to pray. Uh, he sent to Eliakim, who was over the household, Shatna, the scribe, the elders of the priests, and all of them were covered with sackcloth. Because they were humbling themselves before God. And uh, up to Isaiah the prophet. And then they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble. This day is a day of trouble. You all remember the song? We live up our eyes above the troubles in our land and together. Yeah. We sing. Uh, now, do you know that song uh, that uh, it was popularized by Hosanna when they went into South Africa? Remember those days when Hosanna go to different countries and different churches and they recorded praise in different places? 
And uh, that song was uh, sung, uh, uh, brought, uh, introduced when they went to South Africa. At that time, South Africa, there was a lot of trouble. And that song was composed in South Africa. And they were having troubles and all those things. And there was a song that was sung of a reality and uh, how they look to God. Well, here is Hezekiah, that song will be appropriate. We live up our eyes above the troubles. Well, here is the trouble. It's a day of trouble. Rebuke, blasphemy. For the children have come to bow, but there's no strength to bring them forth. It may be, it may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Isaiah, sent to reproach the living God. They were challenging the living God. And will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. They are very weak. They are just starting off. They are picked up from the ruins of the previous king, which was not a good king. So the servants of King Isaiah came to Isaiah. Isaiah says to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, and which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, return to his own land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. And that was exactly what happened. And uh, they heard news of the king of Ethiopia coming forth, and uh, they had to return. And uh, when they went back, uh, they were in the end uh, destroyed. And they didn't even have to fight the battle. So, that was a great victory. And uh, people will remember the victory. People remember Sennacherib's defeat in verse 35. It came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out, killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 people. That's a lot of people. 185,000 people died. One angel. One angel. And it is always a dangerous thing to blaspheme the Lord. Very dangerous to go against the name of our God. And then continuing, when Sinekera, king of Assyria, departed, went away, returned home, remained at Nineveh. Uh, there was the capital. It came to pass as we were worshipping the temple of Nisroch, his God, and his sons, uh, uh, Adramelech, uh, Sharizah, struck him down with a sword. They escaped in the land of Ararat, and Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in this place. So he, he died. And so God continued to prosper Hezekiah and prosper him. But as you know, in cross-reference, the story that we saw the last week, that after the victory, he got pride come in again. That's why it's a very dangerous thing. Remember, I draw this little circle. Uh, let me see. Done. Uh, Okay, this was all night prayer. This was a different one. Um, okay, where's my chart? Okay. Ah, this one. Remember this one? And I remember Brother Yap has a nicer one. <laughs> if you can find it, if not, we we'll go by our one. <laughs> we keep looking for that one. And... Uh, uh, in this chat, uh, you remember that uh, uh, the circle that is gone, that uh, every time we build ourselves up to 100% humility, God blesses us. After God blesses us, we need to learn. Uh, we, God, this is the blessing of God flowing. And then after it, we don't want to go down here because that's pride. I put pride as down rather than up. And... Uh, we should go up to this cycle, to the next cycle, and the key is pruning. Uh, thank you very much. You found a better one. <laughs> okay, uh, this is drawn by Brother Yao, a better one. So, there, uh, humble, humble before God, energy flow into us. And uh, as we are 100% humility, because it's a cycle. It's a cycle. It doesn't mean that you were humble last year, this year you're humble. It doesn't mean that yesterday you were humble, today you're humble. Every day we must die to self. 
And that is the most difficult thing. And I'm going to share a secret to how to always do that. And uh, so, hey, we did share many secrets in this series. Remember what was the secret last week? What was the secret of humility? Yes. Praise and worship. Right? That was a secret. <laughs> There's another secret today. All right. So, here is a, and then when God uses us, we have to be pruned. We have to be pruned so that we can continue on the cycle of humility. And then we continue this cycle onwards all the time. We never go below this line and let pride come in. And so it's very important to die daily to self. And like Paul says, he always says, forgetting those things that are behind. Pressing forward to the things that are before us. We always have to live in the present and prepare for what God has for us in the future. Whatever our past is, two things. Your failures and your success. Leave it behind. Learn from your failures. Strengthen the things that remind you of the success of God in praise and worship. But don't let your past enter your present. If there's any effect, let there be positive effect that help you for the next battle that is to come. We must live that way as long as we're on planet Earth. Because planet Earth is where the battleground is. Things haven't finished yet. In heaven, it's easy to maintain because there's no imperfection. But on planet Earth, it's easy to be pulled down, to be distracted, to be affected by those around us and by the presence of evil. Pre evil might not come, want to come near presence of evil people who whisper into our ears, who say things that uh, God allow us to hear to test us in order for us to see whether we are humble. So remember this chart. Now we go back to the Bible. So Hezekiah, as we mentioned, he got sick. And he got sick because he has pride coming in. But sometimes you're not aware of it until the situation comes. Then God gave him 15 more years. And uh, 15 more years is a long time. And during the 15 years that was there, he forgot how to keep himself humble. He did good things. His 15 years, he was the main guy who put together the book of Psalms. And that was his uh, legacy, King Hezekiah. But here's a story of uh, Babylon that came against him. And um, when they came against him, uh, not really come again, they came to visit. And he showed them everything that was there. And then uh, when Hezekiah asked him, uh, he says, in uh, verse 14, what did those men say and where, do, where did they come from? By the time he asked him, we have a cross-reference that we pointed to you last week. This is 2 Kings. But uh, you cross over. Wow, it's a long one to find. To Chronicles. And uh, in 2 Chronicles, 35 results. Okay, let's just punch to 29. Hey, my punching doesn't doesn't work. Oh, my Bible is stuck. Okay, let me reboot. Okay. Okay, that never happens to a real Bible. Mm -hmm. Or rather, I mean to the physical Bible, only electronic Bibles. Ah, finally it goes through. Okay, I must find out why it's getting stuck there. Eh? Um, so in Second Chronicles, he actually kept the Passover, did all those things. That's why God was blessing him. And um, But when you look lower down, right to the end, after the reforms of Hezekiah, all the good things that he has done, and... Um, <clears throat> There is a story of Sennacherib in chapter 32 of 2 Chronicles. Same story. 
and uh, so he passed by the same story he was defeated and then in verse 24 here's the one chapter 32 verse 24 in those days Hezekiah was sick and near death he prayed to the Lord and he spoke to him and he gave him a sign the sundial going backwards but didn't mention in the book of Kings second Kings but mentioned in Chronicles but Hezekiah did not repay you know, what, what did he need to repay? He did not remember the skill of how to keep on being humble every day for the rest of 15 years. You know how after God healed him and things went back to normal? People forget. I think people forget the Lord very easily. Uh, we have seen it in these five years of this end time move. People forgot the vows they spoke to the Lord. Do you know there are people who spoke vows? I remember when we were building the altar in uh, Snowy Mountain. I, and it was led by the Lord. I said, okay, everyone has to commit themselves. And they spoke the words out of their own mouth. And out of their own mouth, the words that they speak will be brought before them on the judgment day. They vowed to the Lord. They spoke words. Remember, by the spoken word, God judged Israel to go through the wilderness for 40 years. He said, by your own words, I judge. So, our words are very important. And people forget the Lord easily. That is something we must not do in our life. That's something we must learn the secret of how to remind ourselves of the things of the Lord. So here is Hezekiah. He forgot all the, all the things God has done. And in verse 34, he did not repay according to the favor shown him. There were some things God expected him to do. When God gives you extra time, you're supposed to die, God gave you 15 year, years extra. There's something besides the book of Psalms, there's something extra you could do for God that somehow he did not. And I believe I know what that something is. He's supposed to build the next generation. You know, they, the reason for Solomon's success was because David invested in the next generation. Not in the same generation, the next generation. Hezekiah failed to do that. He knew he was going to die. Here is it. A man who is going to die, got 15 extra years. You know what death is like. You know your life is coming to the end. You got 15 more years. You know what you should use for 15 years instead of enjoying yourself? Build the next generation. Train them well. And uh, in the end, wrath was looming. In verse 26, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and his inhabitants. And that's why the wrath of God did not come. But, in verse 27, Hezekiah had very great riches and honor. Now remember, he took over a broken kingdom. He put the Lord first, seek ye first the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added to you. He, he conducted the Passover. A big Passover. He burned all the altars, restored worship of Yahweh. And he made himself treasuries for silver. Here God blessed him and provided cities for himself, possessions, an abundance and everything. However, regarding the ambassadors or the princes of Babylon, the same incident, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him. He forgot to tell them one important thing. It is all because of God. Instead, he took all the credit. He was like showing off. Instead of showing God off. Forgot to give God the glory. Worship again. He forgot to give the glory and worship to God. That's where the pride was coming up. And then he died. And uh, his son Manasseh took over. 
Now his son Manasseh, look at that. How old was he when his son reigned? I'm going to show you. That's why I know he forgot one thing. Manasseh was 12 years old. Now since he had 15 years to live, he had Manasseh in the third year of the 15 years, correct? He could have made sure Manasseh was brought up by a godly man, by good teachers. But he must have done what many rich people do. Not all rich people did that, but a lot of rich people do. They spoil their children. Let your children do everything they want. And then remind the children that whatever blessings that they had came from the Lord. So learn the same principles of our God. And so the wealth cannot last long. Remember, Manasseh inherited all his father's wealth and success. But he, for, he did not inherit the father's worship of Yahweh. The father's desire to please God. They forgot to pass on one thing, spiritual inheritance. They only pass on the physical inheritance. And when he was 12 years old, he became king. Of course, the, the blessing of God was still there in his length of life. He reigned 55 years. That's a long, long time. He was evil. <laughs> Good king, bad king. He was evil. Now, remember, he was only 12 years old. What can a 12 years old do? A lot if he's got good influence. Because after Manasseh, the next son, uh, the, the one in between them called Amon, very shortly got killed. But then the next one was Josiah. And he was only 8 years old. And don't forget what Jesus was when he was 12 years old. So don't underestimate what teenagers can do. If they have godly influence. But it's not really them. It's the godly people around. That could guide them properly. So Manasseh was 12 years old. He did horrible things. He did evil things. He practiced sorcery. All the, his father didn't teach him. His father didn't teach him. Father must have left him you know, to enjoy wealth. He became a sport king and prince. His, a sport prince became a sport king. And uh, did not acknowledge the Lord. Uh, in fact, in uh, cross-reference, in cross-reference to kings, when the book of kings had the same story, he said he shed innocent blood. Evil. For 55 years, it was all evil. Under King Hezekiah, it was all good. Now, under his son, it was all evil. The only thing is, for Manasseh, in the end, Manasseh lost everything. Then when he lost everything, because the king of Assyria came, took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, carried him onto Babylon. When he lost everything, all his riches, all his wealth, all his kingdom and you know when a king take another king to the other place is like a slave it's just like a pet to show that he has power over them it was there when he lost his kingdom position and everything that Manasseh remember God so that tells me something the blockage for this son Manasseh was riches when all the riches was taken when all the power was taken, then he got God. Which means that he must have, him, a good teacher would separate him from all these things first. Teach him properly. And then let him handle riches. And that, unfortunately, did not happen. But in his affliction in verse 12, he humbled himself. Can you see that? Manasseh in the end humbled himself. He says, he humbled himself greatly before God. Of course, he got no more choice. Yeah, he, he's boxed in the corner. And here's a little key for us. Do you know how much God wants humility? 
so much so that whether you like it or not, everyone will be humble. Didn't God say he resists the proud? When he resists the proud, what happens when the proud is resisted? The proud is caused to bend the knees. Didn't that, isn't that going, what's going to happen to the devil? It says, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, including the tongue of Satan and the knee of Satan bending. He refused to bend now, but one day, he has to. Every fallen angel, hear the word of the Lord. And Satan himself, hear the word of the Lord. For the day will come when Satan will bow before Jesus, his knee will bow, and all the fallen angels will bow, and they will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. As for humans, when they are proud and they resist, God resists them. And like King Nebuchadnezzar, they're broken down until they reach a point where they have to bend the knee and acknowledge Jesus is Lord. Whether here in this life or at the judgment day, when they face our Lord Jesus, the supreme judge. For us, whether we like it or not, humility is the only way. Either we give it voluntarily, or God will use circumstances to force it on you. Because God will have no other gods before Him. He reigns above. When we know how important being humble before God is, that He will... He will shake the heavens and the earth around us to humble us. It is better to humble before the heavens and earth shake. Let's humble ourselves voluntarily than being humbled by circumstances. As you saw happen in Manasseh. But uh, after he humbled himself, he got back the kingdom for a short while. And then he quickly built everything, quickly do all the good things. And then in verse 16, he repaired the altar of the Lord. <laughs> finally. He should have done that long ago. He finally repaired the altar that he himself destroyed and polluted. He sacrificed peace of thanksgiving. And he commanded Judah to serve God and then died. If he served, uh, he was uh, 12 years old, then plus 55, which means 5, 6, uh, 67 years old. Then he died. He should have done that long, long time ago. And you know how, how stubborn humans are sometimes, right? They, say, they, they always uh, don't acknowledge God until towards the end. Nevertheless, the people still sacrifice the high places because it's... And also established that evil was there. And Manasseh died. And uh, then for some time, his son Amon uh, tried to reign, 22 years old. But only two years, got killed. Then the next one, uh, the great grandson. And he says that Amon died because, in verse 23, same thing. Two years only his reign, he did not humble himself. Then why did Manasseh last so long? Because of his father's legacy. See, the blessing of the father caused it to be very long. Like King Solomon, I mean, he inherited the blessing from King David. Reigned also for the years. And, uh, so, because of evil that's taken place, by the time Amon stepped into it, Amon, if he had worshipped the Lord, was different. But the main thing the Lord was against them was this. Did not humble, or humble, or did not humble, or humble. Always the two choices. And uh, within two years, as he sinned more and more, his own servants conspired against him, killed him. So you have a revolution. And then, of course, uh, the people executed those who executed him. So there was chaos. And in the chaos, verse chapter 34, Josiah was chosen to be king. 
How old was he? Only eight years old. Definitely he was not ruling. You know who was ruling? The priests that were around him were helping him. And um, while he was young, he sought the Lord. The God and his father David. In the twelfth year, he began to push Judah and Jerusalem in the high places. And he broke down the altars of Baal that were built all during the time of um, Manasseh. And so he did to all the cities. And in the 18th year of his reign, as he sent to all these good people around, there, were, there was Hilkiah the high priest. And uh, Hilkiah the high priest was the one who was actually helping Josiah reign. And because a priest was involved, he bring back the worship of Yahweh. And also there was Huldah the prophetess. So there was prophet, priest and king. Finally the three are together again, although he's a young king. And uh, when they came to Hilkiah the high priest, they delivered money that was going to the house of God. And uh, the Levites and all those were gathered together. And uh, then in the end, when they were redoing the temple, they discover the Dia Bible again, which was the book of the law. Remember, their Bible is smaller than ours, it's only Old Testament. So they discover their Bible because no one was reading the Bible anymore. So when they discover their Bible, Hekiah says, we have found the book of the law, the one from original, Moses. And they all gathered together, and then Shaphan the scribe told the king, Hikaya the priest has given me a book. I mean, it's a rare book. I mean, it's supposed to be common, but it was rare because of all the evil. They've forgotten the Bible. Finally, they read the Bible before the king. When the king heard it, Verse 19, he tore his clothes. That is a sign of repentance. You know, tearing your clothes, putting inside cloth, humbling yourself. He tore his clothes and then he says, we have sinned. I mean, they will remember all the commandments. And where do they start? So they say, go inquire for the Lord for me. Who are left in Israel, Judah, concerning this book? The words of this book, he says, no wonder we are suffering. The wrath of God is on us. According to all that is written in the book, God is true. So Hilkiah and the king appointed uh, and went to Huda, the prophetess, and uh, then she prophesied. Thus says the Lord, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, I will still bring, and God will still bring calamity on, the, on this place, on the inhabitants. All the curses are written in the book, which they are read before the kings of Judah, before the king of Judah. They have forsaken me, and so the judgment was still there. As for the king of Judah, this is the good part, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner you shall speak. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, you humble yourself before God. When you heard His words against this place, against His inhabitants, you humble yourself before me. You tore your clothes. See, God was watching him tear his clothes. I would like to demonstrate, but I only got one shirt, so I'm not going to demonstrate. Sure, I brought an old shirt, right, next time. <laughs> next time I wear an old shirt, the old shirt outside, new shirt inside, go... <coughs> yeah, wait till another preaching, right? And so he tore his clothes, and uh, he says, God saw it. Wept before me, I have heard you. And did you realize how important this was? He restored true worship, a Passover, and everything. But the most important part was very unique. And here's the thing. Remember, Josiah is the name prophesied who will destroy the 
altar of Jeroboam. Same guy. Same king. Predestination. But predestination or no predestination, if he did humble himself, these things won't happen. So don't just rely on your predestination and become proud. Predestination only works when we choose humility. Don't forget, Judas Iscariot was predestined to be one of the twelve. His place was taken by Matthias. It is because Josiah humbled himself, he wanted to remove all, and his desire to remove all. After reading the word of God, he realized how abominable these things are. He wanted to clean up all the land. By that time, the northern land was already gone. All in tatters and torn. Remember, the southern kingdom lasted longer than the northern kingdom. And so, he wanted to clean all the land of Israel, including Judah. And in verse chapter 35, he kept the Passover and uh, they slaughtered uh, all the animals for the first time. They, they didn't even keep the Passover for so many years. And he restored the Passover, the service of the, that the Lord prepared. And um, so they kept all those uh, feasts uh, unto the Lord. But let's cross reference to 2 Kings because there's a little story that I want to read on the altar of the prophets. So in 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 2, that is at the beginning of the northern kingdom, a young prophet came and prophesied and said, Behold, a child Josiah by name shall be born to the house of David. On you you shall sacrifice the priests of the high place who burn incense on you, and man's moon shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign on the same day. And this is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. And the sign came forth. The young prophet, in the end, didn't obey God. And uh, he was deceived by an old retired prophet who deceived him to eat. Because the Lord said, you cannot eat. You have pronounced judgment on the land. And you must cross the border before you can eat. It's, it's obvious. If he knew principle, the principles of shaking the dust off your feet means you must go out of the place before you can actually be out of judgment. So it was under judgment. And when he was deceived to eat something, the young prophet died. But even if prophets go astray, the words that they originally speak under the anointing of God still remains. He said, how come? Because we all may be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, or leaders, we are all just different types of donkey. Even a donkey can prophesy. Even a donkey can see angels. Even a donkey can do the right thing. Even a donkey can reason. Balaam's donkey. Right now in heaven, Balaam's donkey is recognized by all the animal kingdom. Having done a good work for God, and he got his reward. See, donkeys rewarded. We are all donkeys, although you might not like it. We carry Jesus on our back. Some of us are apostle donkeys, prophet donkeys, evangelist donkeys, pastor donkeys, teacher donkeys, leader donkeys, all of them. But don't go around calling each other donkey, like, not nice word. <laughs> This is just for teaching to let us know that the word that we have is more important than what we are. What we are are instruments. So the young prophet's word was there. And it still remained. 
So the donkey might miss, go off, off tangent, but the word is still there. And we have to discern what is the word of God. So he prophesied, and uh, finally, when Josiah reigned, in chapter 23, verse of uh, 2 Kings, when Josiah restored uh, worship again in Israel, it tells us some of the things that he did, and there is the same prophecy in verse 15, fulfillment. After so many kings, hundreds of years, hundreds of years later, the word was finally fulfilled. And his name was Josiah. By predestination, God spoke hundreds of years ago that a king called Josiah. I think by the time his, um, his mother or his parents named him Josiah, they don't remember the prophecy. Everyone forgotten. They say it was a good name. Let's name him Josiah. And moreover, it said the altar that was in battle, the high place with Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, the altar, the high place, he broke down. He burned the high place. And then when he was burning the high place, he crushed it into powder. Because he, remember, he was not aiming to fulfill the prophecy. He didn't know about the prophecy. Isn't that the amazing thing? He didn't know about the prophecy. He was just in the process of trying to get rid of all the abominations. And the battle was the main place that Israel sinned against long ago. So he wanted to get rid of that too. And as he was getting rid of that, all those things, he turned around, he saw tombs on the mountain. Then he said, then he sent to them, he said, get all those tombs and burn them here. Exactly fulfill the prophecy, which he did not know. Prophecy fulfilled by the person who doesn't know prophecy fulfilled. And re you remember how in this movie, sometimes read out and say, this is what the Bible meant. Remember when the Bible says in the book of Revelations that the holy city of Jerusalem, in which no, um, uh, no unclean can enter. And then I ask you a puzzle. I said, they already got new heaven and new earth. So where does those evil people exist? Because it's after the judgment day. Remember the book of Revelation. And they say, how come they are still there? And I mentioned they are still there because New Jerusalem cross over into our dimension. Outside the gates refer to beyond the judgment day. Into our time. And then we didn't know about it. Until God started showing New Jerusalem. And then we asked God, Lord, in this move, how do we stop Satan from going into the pristine area where we established? And then God showed this verse, New Jerusalem. So we started praying for New Jerusalem glory. When we pray for New Jerusalem glory to be in this time, then the Lord began to reveal. Prophecy fulfilled, which we didn't know about it. it you, this, all this movie is recorded on videos. So you can see the progression, how we just prayed. There was a time when we fasted. It was what I call the two-day, three-day fast. Uh, a two-time, three-day fast that was close to each other. When we pray about New Jerusalem glory. Then when we pray, and I just cross-reference cross to that verse and then come back again. Because that verse is relevant to our end time. In uh, chapter 21 of Revelations, when already new heaven, new earth come to pass, correct? Do you know all the judgments are finished in chapter 20 of Revelation? In chapter 20, also the devil gone. Dealt with. End of millennium, end of devil's rebellion, everything cuts into the lake of fire, no more. Finish, no more evil. So in chapter 21, new heaven, new earth. No more judgment after that. And yet, it tells us suddenly, when it talks about New Jerusalem, which is the Lamb's wife, which is us, the bride of Christ, in verse 10. 
And then he described the city, its construction, the glory of New Jerusalem. And uh, then he says in verse uh, 26, They shall bring glory and honor the nations into it, but there shall by no means, and this is a verse God gave us, how to preserve in this end time the pristine area. God's, God gave us this verse. Verse 27, There shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or cause an abomination or lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So God said, that's the line. It's not the blood line. This is the New Jerusalem line. Nothing can enter into it. And then, when you go to chapter 22, there is all the glory of New Jerusalem and everything that is there. And uh, then, as it mentions all these uh, wonderful things that are there in uh, New Jerusalem, then it says in verse 15, chapter 22, Outside are dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters. So I ask the question, where do these people come from? New heaven, new earth. And then God showed in this end time move what this verse means. Because right now, there is no scholar on earth that could interpret this. It remains a puzzle. But God showed it's something like that. Done. Okay, I got to go right to the end. God show. Oh, why did I do that? Bring it back up. Black thing line. Black line, yes. Like it is a thick line. This is the present universe. And it includes the millennium in this section. Millennium is in this section. Then this thick line, new heaven, new earth. And in new heaven, new earth, we know there is New Jerusalem. NJ, New Jerusalem. Of course, those, uh, uh, we're starting a U.S. church actually end of this year. And uh, I cannot, cannot go there because it's too near my fast. I'll visit them next year. But uh, COG US, we're going to relaunch in uh, December. New Jersey. I like the NJ. NJ remind me of that. And uh, so in December, and Pastor Elijah and Cynthia, who is the coordinator there, Pastor Elijah in COG Canada and uh, Cynthia in COG USA, they're going to represent me there. And uh, I. I I will be there. Uh, told Pastor Joe that I'll be there next year. So NJ, New Jersey for them. New Jerusalem in this illustration. And so, say here's the thing. It says in Revelation 20, outside are dogs. Woof, woof. All the bad people and all that. See how how can they be there? This is new heaven, new earth, after the judgment, great white throne judgment, lake of fire. How can those things, you know, how can those things be here? Ridiculous. And the mystery was not solved until in this end time move, God showed. Da -da, da -da, da -da. Oh, sorry, wrong one, wrong button. And God showed all those disappearing. That actually, what happened is the powers of the age to come enter our dimension. The glory of New Jerusalem. Cross into our time zone only in this move. So I got to draw another line in this end time move. It is allowed. Because in this end time move, there will be dogs, which represent religious people, according to the Bible, Paul did say. There will be sorcerers, which are the followers of the Antichrist and the false prophet, who will do signs and wonders using evil power. They will make stone statues talk. 
We haven't reached that time yet, but we will cross a time called the supernatural. Hum humanity have crossed many lines. We have crossed in 1945, we entered the nuclear age. Before that, when they discovered quantum theory and Einstein theory, we entered into a time of uh, science, when science became very big. And then we enter the nuclear age. We all know today we are affected by the internet age. The internet has affected everything. Political, governments, and all that. All that are now suddenly realize that they have to control they, they, they realize the internet is way more powerful than normal media. And it's affected economics. Because of the internet today, businesses are being affected. Some businesses are closing down because they cannot survive. Printing business is going out because everyone got a printer. When the internet age came about and now we all use digital things, we hardly need paper. Paper will still be there. And it's more and more coming. People are now buying online. It hasn't come to Asia that much yet, but it will happen. In US, it's already happening because in US, when you to buy something, and the stores are very big and the distance very very far. And you've got to drive from one place to another. It's easier to buy online. And you know, rather than look for it here, look for it there. And in US, malls are going out of fashion. Empty. Nobody wants to go to the mall. And so a lot of malls are empty and going to be reinvented, turned into office space or housing or whatever. And of course, it might come a full circle. Like remember when uh, in those days when videos came out, the cinema started going out of business, and they got to reinvent the cinema. Until today, it survived based on a different thing. That it's mainly for fellowship. Remember our old place at Golden Theatre. And uh, they show old movies, but it's not the movies that people come for. It is a f the mingling with the social group they want to. They reinvent those things. So we enter the nuclear age, the internet age. There will be a place called the supernatural line. When things will start happening, we cannot explain with science. Because it will cross over into what I call, uh, I won't call it pseudoscience, means a false science. It will call, cross into metaphysical areas. Metaphysical. It's beyond science. It seems to be spiritual powers that affect the area. In this end time move, we have some prophecies about what the false prophet will do, who is already born in 2004, which means that, uh, how old is he? 2017 minus 2004. 13 years old. Wow, 13 years old this year. Wow, year of rebellion. No, 13 is rebellion. Okay, it's 13 years old this year. And some of the prophecies that came about the false prophet is he can make the river go uphill. Now, that one, science will find it hard to. And then he will bring out a type of uh, what I call invention of energy from the air. So, I know whether it's free energy or source energy or whatever it was, we got to watch very carefully. But we will cross what I call the supernatural age. And we also will cross over. You know when we cross over? When we take the stick and turn it back into snake. Then for the first time, people say, wow, Bible story real. Eh? Of course it's real a lot of time. Why do you think those are just play, play one? Eh? And you know what? What some of my professors sometimes try to explain scientifically because too much science, they say, it's not really a stick. It looked like a stick. And then when some they explain, when you throw down some sort of illusion trick. So the stick was there and it's not you come on, illusion trick. Illusion trick. It's just like you know how they try to explain the the parting of the Red Sea? They say, Oh, the waters are only up to here, you know. And that's why they cross over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we joke, remember? Pharaoh and all his people got drowned. <laughs> Waste the water. That makes it more silly. If they read the Bible, the Bible says that the water was like a wall. 
They didn't read the Bible. The Bible said like a wall on two sides. A tall wall. I mean standing straight, 90 degree. We could even use a measurement tool, the carpenter and measure, you will find exactly 90 degree. It's standing 90 degree and only like a force field was holding it because we know it's a spirit being. So it's the age of the supernatural will come back and then when they talk about Moses throwing his stick and it turned into a snake, they say, illusion, yeah, illusion. Then how come all the other magicians' stick disappear? In fact, how did his stick eat up their stick? That's even more puzzling. Then his stick come alive and all the stick go in. No, it's a real snake. So the day will come also we cross a line and we turn a stick into a snake. And you know what I'm doing when the Lord showed the prophecy? And I say, okay, let me think what kind of stick I like. You know? And you could have a rambutan stick, durian stick, or rattan stick, or bamboo stick, or whatever. And so I say, I would like the same kind of stick like Moses had. Because I knew Moses' stick was an almond. Because it produced almonds in the, in the Bible, in the book of Numbers. So I said, uh, I like my sample to be almond. So same thing. So I planted an almond tree outside my Sydney house. And uh, it's still growing. And every time I look at the tree, every time I go back, I say, you're going to be harvested. <laughs> Grow nicely. So it grown straight branches and I'm waiting for it to uh, grow nicely. And now, at first I wanted a stick, you know, a good rod eh, should be about your height or slightly. Then it's nice, just slightly higher. That will be a good looking thing. Then I realized, hey, we actually don't need so long. Eh? You know, imagine carrying to the airport. Eh? Each time you check in and check out. You know, there's no bag that can go in. <laughs> So I realized, ah, sample will be good enough. So sample stick, you could, you know, check in, check out, or you can carry it, maybe like that, like a lightsaber or something. So instead of uh, Skywalker, you go, ching, the, the light stick coming out, all you did, you say, what? A wooden stick. Wait, can change into a snake. So the day will come when we cross over into the supernatural. But like the... Bible people who have prophecies, we have our own prophecies here that the Lord gave. We have to prepare ourselves. I prepare myself by planting the almond stick, showing my faith in God. That, that's it. I know some of you, when you visit, you already reserve different part of the branches, right? So, so I got some people say, hey, give me part of the stick. I said, wow, the whole tree will be gone. Eh? So let it grow a bit more. But uh, it's interesting that uh, we use the time. But that's what the Lord showed when uh, he says the powers of the age to come will extend here and all these things are describing our time sorcerers and all these other people that will be at work in the crossing the line called the age of the supernatural that will be there so that's the prophecies that we have received in god and that's why we are preparing for it and that's why we give ourselves to the Word of God today and keep flowing forth. And, um, so, let's look back at the Bible. And, um, oh, I think there's a way to do history. Let me see. Three finger, two finger. I forgot. Uh, okay, my sliding back history is not that good. Ah, oh, no. Three fingers go back to the first chapter. No, this goes back book by book. Okay, let me go back to the search engine and um, oh we, we talk about Josiah how he fulfilled scriptures and uh, second Kings when he was uh, punch it okay okay we got the scriptures up so when he turned around he saw the bones and uh, without realizing what he was doing to fulfill prophecy he turned around and then as they, as they started digging up the bones, they came across one tomb. Then he says, whose is this? Then they said, it's the person who prophesied about you coming. See, he didn't know. But it says, uh, it is a tomb of the man of God who came from Judah, proclaimed these things that you have done. Exact fulfillment. 
So in our time, there is a lot of understanding of prophecy when we saw like Revelation chapter 22 and chapter 21, we say, that says, and I can prove it. We, Paul only had a glimpse of New Jerusalem. He called the church New Jerusalem. Hebrews chapter 12. And in the same chapter where he talked about New Jerusalem, he talked about the 2029 shaking, that we have a date for it. Say, yet once more will I shake heaven and earth. That's the 2029 shaking. It will be the largest international shaking the world has ever seen. Simultaneous earthquake over the whole planet. England sinking down. New Zealand, the rising up and becoming just one island. Parts uh, the, the southern hemisphere go up here, the northern goes down. And simultaneous earthquake all over the world. And underground, underwater earthquake causing tsunamis 100 story tall. So, it is that big shaking. And the Lord has given the exact day of the shaking, but not to be revealed yet, we only release the year. Everything is in Hebrews 12, and, they are, and we continue to announce that. Some people say, well, 2029, very far away. Oh yeah, preparing a life, preparing our life for it will take decades. Remember the story of Manasseh, 12 years old, born under the 15 years of Hezekiah. 15 years wasted, could have been invested in the second generation. So don't waste this time, 2029 to 2017, how many more years? Oh, nice number. Eh? <laughs> 12 years. Important not to waste the time. Get deep into God's word. Prepare ourselves. Most important, seek the Lord consistently. Seek the Lord diligently. And the Lord will come forth. So it says, when he saw that it was a tomb of the man of God who prophesied, things coming to pass, which he didn't know when anything came, he says, let him alone. And so his bones were left alone. But every other thing that is declared of him crushing the bones, burning on the altar, was fulfilled exactly. The word of God and every prophecy will come to pass. So we learn one thing. The whole story is about humility. Hezekiah need to be humble. He humbled himself, God bless him. Then towards his last time, he forgot to maintain humility. Manasseh, his son, did evil. Only when he lost everything, then he humbled himself. Then his son Amon became evil. Two years, died. Then the great-grandson of uh, Hezekiah, Josiah, finally come. He didn't know he was going to be the man who fulfilled prophecy. All he knew was, humble yourselves before the Lord your God. And out of humbling himself, he found his destiny. So when you talk about his predestination, foreknowledge, the things of God, and everything that God has given, the most important thing is still humility. Without that, nothing works. Learning to be humble before God is important. Now, Josiah did many things, but Josiah's life didn't end nicely. Sadly, in fact, in verse 28, all the works were good, everything. In his days, in verse 29, uh, 29, in his days, Pharaoh Nico, king of Egypt, went to the aid of king Assyria. And by the way, do you know that when you were worshipping God in tongues today, that you keep calling on Nico's name? Yeah. Anyway, it's on, it's on, uh, on, uh, on the recorded thing in the worship. And uh, 
your, your tongues go, you know, for today. Yeah. And I was there because I understood some tongues. And I say, this guy's praying for the sermon, uh, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, those of you who are hearing the worship, you can replay that section. And that section, he, uh, there were two breaks in tongues, and uh, he mentioned Neko's name about three times. Yeah, you didn't know it. Yeah. We were worshiping, you know, release anointing of God, whatever, you know, all those things, and partly also interceding for the word of God that was coming forth, preparing. So anyway, talk about Pharaoh and Nico, and uh, and so in his days, Pharaoh Nico, king of Egypt, went to the aid of king of Syria, to the river Euphrates, and then King Josiah, go and went against him. None of his business. In fact, when he was going, King uh, Pharaoh Nico uh, killed him at Megiddo. Uh, and, uh, in fact, before Pharaoh Nico killed him, he was asked by Pharaoh Nico not to come. Say, keep to tend to your house. Uh, don't come. Now, uh, that part is found in uh, Kings. Some of you might notice that Kings, the story of Second Kings and Second Chronicles, sometimes are the same. Except some is saying, you see, Chronicles is a record, and usually they take away all the, they record, they take away the bad parts sometimes, and they record the part that is from God's perspective, from the priest and God's perspective. That's why it's Chronicles. Kings is just a historical record. So that's the contrast. That's why some details are not recorded, but recorded in history, not recorded by the scribes. In, in terms of the temple history, nothing related to the temple. And um, so we got to find that part in uh, Second Kings. Second Kings, uh, towards the end of restoring the worship, destroying all these um, abomination, it says about his battle in verse 28. Second Kings 23, verse 28. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah, all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Are they Chronicles? He refer you back. In his days, Pharaoh Nico, came, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him. And Pharaoh Nico killed him. And Megiddo, when he confronted him, so his body um, sort of was moved by the people and uh, they took him back and put him in his father's place then Jehoahaz uh, came about and uh, <clears throat> that's the sad part of the story that was, that was there in uh, a good king died I call it unnecessarily it was an unnecessary death because of um, his zeal to want to uh, do that. Chapter 35 has some details in Second Chronicles about him dying on battle. It says in verse, Second Chronicles 35 verse 20. 35 verse 20, after all this, when Josiah, after all the good things, Josiah prepared the temple, Nico came out to fight against Chemish by the Euphrates. And here's the, all the messengers. He sent messages to him saying, when Josiah wanted to join, you know, not, none of his business actually, it's a battle between other kings. Josiah tried to go in, and he sent a messenger, Nico sent a message to the king of Judah says, what have I to do with you, king of Judah? I have not come against you this day, but against a house which I am having a war with. For God commanded, and of course he don't know why he used God's name, God commanded me to make haste, refrain from meddling with God who is with me, <laughs> lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguise himself so that he might fight with him, did not hear the words of Nico from the mouth of God. Actually, God was allowing that. Because when the king Nico 
call upon Yahweh's name, he was acknowledging Yahweh. Imagine that. They were acknowledging Yahweh God. They must have seen the works of Yahweh God. And so at Megiddo, when he disguised himself, he was shot. And out of the arrow wound, he died. And I will ask a question. Why did he go? Pride. Yes! Pride what? Remember, when you succeed, the mountain of success is also a place that is dangerous. Because when you succeed, you might do things that you naturally can do, but should not do. Because when you got power and wealth, you want to do some things. You thought you can do anything. Learn to be like David. He got the power, the resources, the ability, the architectural plan from God to build a temple. There is, do you realize that there is nothing in the natural that stopped David from building the temple? It was all because God said, you're not to build, that he set his heart to obey God. There was nothing in the natural that could have stopped him. Of course, if he tried, God will use natural too, I realize. But I'm talking about his ability, his riches, his resources. His strategy, I mean, he can organize. He only did not do it because the Lord said not to do it. That is real humbling and real humility. So we look at some of the kings and how God requires humbling. You see these stories. King, you know, uh, started, inherited a, a horrible kingdom, humbled himself, got prosper. Then the next king, you know, became a bad king, and then didn't humble himself, destroyed the whole thing, then lost everything, humbled himself, then got preserved. Then the next king, uh, young, young and tender, humble himself, got prosper. Then at the end, forgot about, you know, he, he started doing things beyond his ability, died early, could have lived very long. Humility is very important. When a king humbles themselves, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, they pray and fast, I will hear them. There is an outward way in which we can show our humbling. Of course, it can be, anything can be imitated and be false. But the Bible does record that all these kings, they have a common way they humble themselves, as you all really realize. They tore their clothes. And then they humble themselves, put on side cloth, and God heard them. In the book of Psalms, David understood this principle and he says in the Psalms, book of Psalms, ah, okay, I put on the wrong search engine, yes, this is the one I wanted. In the book of Psalms, and we're going to look at just some of them. Psalms 35 verse 13. But as for me, he talk about the e evil people do, he says, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth, I humble myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my heart. Do you know that Humbling yourself and fasting are related. But at the same time, Isaiah 58 does talk there's a real fast and a false fast. 
There's a false fast where people do outwardly, but their heart didn't humble. But if you actually humble yourself and you fast, and fasting is a type of way of humbling yourself, it releases breakthroughs. If you are hearing this message and you need breakthroughs, now, no matter how much you fast and pray and worship, if the time of God is not time, it just will not work also. But what it will do is that it will create energy and momentum that in the fullness of time will come back to you still. No energy spiritually, spiritual energy spent in fasting, in prayer, in worship is wasted. They become stored and become clouds of blessing that will rain back on us. So, what we want to show is fasting is related to humbling the soul. In the book of Psalms, chapter 69, verse 10, it says, When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also make sackcloth my garment. Do you notice? The soul is humble by fasting. That is why I live a fasted life. A fasted life means out of, I could eat three meals, plus supper if you want, and tea. I choose to eat one main meal, which means morning is fast, evening is basically a fast, and you eat only one meal. Then on top of that, I choose two days to fast, but this week uh, I was late for all night prayer uh, when let the worship start first, because it was one of my extra fasts where I do three day fast. And so Friday night was my last third day of fast. So my usual fast is two days, Thursday and Friday. Uh, you should, I started off in the ministry with a 40 day fast every year, January the 1st to February the 9th. And then sometimes extra 40 day fast. As you know, this year we, I had two 40 day fasts, not counting the other fasts in between. And then Friday is always a fast because Friday was always all night prayer. And I know how important all night is, so it's important to fast and pray to release more energy in the Lord. Then Thursday became my fast when the Lord told me that uh, I would not die but be uh, trans translated on September the 18, 2016. I had prayed for, uh, I think, uh, at least uh, 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 decades that, that I would be like Enoch, I would walk with God and not die. So finally, you know, came through the words of the prophets that says, you know, you are. And then, it's, you know, and it says, uh, that's it. And uh, of course, you know, as, uh, uh, there's a bit of jealousy involved and all those at the same time when the prophecy is released. But uh, then you say, oh, you only got it because you were asking, you know. But I realized it was more than that. Then it became predestination, then it became other things that the Lord showed that I was like, uh, and, uh, like a guinea pig, you know, to, 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 to do everything uh, uh, first. So uh, there was a lot of it. So when I discovered that and was revealed, you know my response? I dedicate all my Thursdays to fasting for the rest of my life. See, this is the response that God loves. And so they added two days to the fast, which means, you know, and then when you have extra fast, so in the end, I tell many people, now the, I, I, instead of counting the days of fasting, it's easier to count how many days I can eat. Eat normally, I mean. So, um, and, uh, fasting is a way, if you do it correct, I... Again, I quote the Bible to be balanced. Isaiah 58 says there's a wrong type of fast also, where the heart is not involved. But when the heart is involved and, the, and your whole being is involved and you fast, you fast, it actually, it is an amplifier of whatever you do. Without amplifiers, sound doesn't work as much. And they got many types of amplifier. Do you know the laser beam? is also light stimulation and amplification. It amplifies the same wavelength of light until the, the photons travel in pairs like soldiers and they can cut through everything. 
Amplification is a very important key to breakthrough. If you're praying for something seriously, fast. Fast. Fast not to twist God's arm. How dare you think such things? You know, nobody can, can, can do that. God is God. But fast to amplify the whatever you're praying, the energy that is released. I believe personally, one day solid prayer with fasting might equal to, you know, a whole months of prayer without fasting. This is picking off uh, something without really measuring it. I had to find the Bible verses to actually measure something. And imagine 40 days of fasting through the Bible, what it does. And when Jesus was taken to the wilderness, the Bible never mentioned Matthew 4, Mark 1, and Luke chapter 4. It never mentioned that the Lord led him to fast. It only say he was driven in Mark 1 by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted, to be tested. So it only records he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. It never say he was led there to be to fast. But when he was there, he fasted because he knows amplification in fasting. So let me show a worst case scenario. One of the most evil men in the Bible hardly got any good insight. You all know who I'm talking to. Mr. Jezebel. Say what? I, no, there's a Mrs. Je Jezebel. Ahab. The reason why I call him Mr. Jezebel is because he is so influenced by, the, by Mrs. Jezebel that everything he do was actually her. See in chapter 21 of First Kings, it tells us here regarding Ahab. And, uh, okay, uh, let me get, uh, this, and this is in Naboth's vineyard. In Naboth's vineyard. So here's a, here's a uh, king uh, Ahab, and he when he 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 wanted his neighbor's vineyard, and the whole plotting was by Jezebel. Jezebel helped him to do all the evil things, and. Uh, it, look at verse 25 first. First Kings 21, 25. There was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. So all you young men out there, remember Mary properly. You marry Mrs. Jezebel, you're gone now. And he says here, and he behaved very abominably in following idols, according to all the Amorites had done. So, and you can see even in this incident, he is a selfish, horrible guy. But his wife was more clever than him to do evil. And uh, you see, he didn't know how to take over the living yet. The wife came up with all the schemes of murder and then false witnesses and then used his stem and authority. Uh, so he was bad, he was really evil. And so after he took over the vineyard, 
with his wife's help, he was there enjoying the vineyard that he wanted all the time, his covetousness. So as he went around the vineyard looking, Elijah was sent there. So Elijah went there and uh, because he says, he says in verse 18, Arise, go and meet Ahab. He is now in the vineyard. Elijah is quite a brave guy. You know, the king has soldiers. Elijah only got God and his angel. So when God sent him to give a word, he just went there alone. And so he went there alone and I like the way they greet each other. When Ahab saw Elijah coming to the place, he says, Have you found me, O oh my enemy? Well, <laughs> they greet each other nicely. You know, you have found me, my enemy. Hi, my enemy. You know. And then Elijah also answered, I have found you. <laughs> and he says, Because you're so evil to do evil in the sight of God. And he says, This is a calamity I, God will bring to you. That says a lot. And he spoke judgment. On him and all his children and everything will be cut off and destroyed. A horrible judgment. And about the dogs that will lick Jezebel's blood. All the horrible prophecies. And say the dogs will eat you. The dogs will eat, the birds will eat you. The most horrible death. And he says no one was like Ahab with so wickedness. He was really, 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 really a bad guy. And uh, if I put him under the electron mi microscope, I might just find one tiny atom of good. You all know what electron microscope is, right? You can look at atoms and molecules. So he's really bad. I mean, there was nothing that he did that was really good. But he says... Very strange. It says in verse 27. So it was, when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes. And he said, hey, wait, wait, wait. I thought the good king is supposed to do that. But here's the bad king. He's a bad guy. So the bad guy with hardly an atom of goodness tore his clothes. Then he put on sackcloth and he fasted. He lay on sackcloth. He went mourning. I mean, everyone who is a good guy will wish that he die quickly. But God is God. So who said the Old Testament God is not compassionate? God is God. When Elijah, who didn't know anything, he just delivered the word and went off. The word of God came to Elijah and said, Look at verse 29. See how Ahab humbled himself. What? A bad guy humbled himself? Hey, wait a minute. You didn't realize that King Nebuchadnezzar is known for a lot of bad things? He did humble himself. He did a lot of bad things and he also humbled himself. And then he, he switched between the two. Remember how he almost wanted to destroy and kill Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? You know, a lot of these kings, uh, they, they've done a lot of bad things. But none as terrible as Ahab, who defied the Lord. I never expect him to humble himself. Elijah don't expect him to humble himself. Of course, God, I cannot say. <laughs> God knows all things. God saw Ahab humble himself. And then God responded to this evil guy. Humbling. Didn't I tell you humbling very powerful? He humbled himself. And then God says, all right, I'll bring judgment on his sons, not on him. What? God! He's a bad guy! He's guilty! See how powerful humbling is? And you know why the Bible records that story? To tell us how powerful humbling is. If a bad guy humble himself, God does that. How much more average people and good guys good guys. Here in Australia, uh, I mean here in Singapore, you can say good guys. 
in, in Australia, we got a shop called Good Guys, so I cannot use Good Guys. <laughs> in a way, say, Good Guys, say, yeah, advertise my shop. No, we're not talking about that electronic shop called Good Guys. You might change the name by then. And uh, Good Guys, gals, humble themselves. Ladies and gentlemen who humble themselves, God hears. And when this principle of humbling ourselves by fasting and prayer is combined with last week's principle of worship, oh, the amount of amplification is beyond. And you know why? How many people humble themselves and fast and pray for breakthroughs, for problems, when things around you, things cannot, things cannot solve, a lot. The Bible says, if my people face all these things, humble themselves and pray, correct? But how many people fast and pray to worship God? Ah, very little. The Bible record one incident. When people did that, they gave themselves to fasting and prayer, not asking for anything. They only came to love God. Say, God, I will love you and show my love to you by fasting today. See, most people, when they fast, you know, they got into the mood of, gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy, 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 here, my fasting, fasting, fasting. Because <laughs> we want something. But how many people fast and pray saying, I love God? See, my Thursday's fast is love God. My Friday fast is for breakthroughs. It's a Thanksgiving fast for me on Thursday. When you understand this principle and incorporate that into your life, it is a way to please God. Isn't what, what we live our lives? See, uh, the most important thing to me in life is our personal life to please God. Ministries come and go, people come and go, uh, thousands of people come and go. At the end of the day, you face a judgment seat one on one. And you want to be able to say, I have lived my life to walk closely with the Almighty God. Everything else is just fringe benefits that God has. Acts 13, verse 1, and verse 2. It's good that it's a New Testament example. Now, I believe personally that David practiced that. And the Bible people practice that, except that we don't have clear-cut records. That's why they got so much breakthrough. So it must have happened many times in the Bible, but this is the clearest incident of people who come together with only one motive. It says in verse 1 and 2. Now in the church, there was an Antioch. There were certain prophets and teachers. And so only it was a leader's meeting. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, Cyrene, Lucius or Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, five people. So the five were named, and five people came together in verse 2 as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. They did not come to pray for breakthrough. They did not come because they have problems. They did not come because they have a need. I'm sure they have needs. They came, they fasted to give God love and worship. You combine last week's principle, the secret of worship, with the keys to humbling yourself, put them together, it is the most powerful release of heavenly forces. 
And on that day, that God must have predestined and foreknowledge knew it was going to happen. And that was the day God released the first missionary journey of Paul. And Paul's missionary journey and Paul's destiny and life changed all our modern Christianity. Without Paul's theology and doctrines and Paul's stand on firmness on doctrine, we all might be today Jews. It was Paul who opposed the Judaizing of the church and said that the Gentiles must be free from Jewish laws. Peter went along. Barnabas was also sometimes swaying. It was Apostle Paul who said, for the Gentiles, they let them have faith in Christ. They don't need to follow Jewish laws. Except for the good ones that benefit. So, it was a revolution. But that revolution started on that day. Do you know when the first great awakening started? Some of you might not have read history. First great awakening was the Christian revival under John Wesley and George Whitfield. George Whitfield, John Wesley and his brother Charles Wesley, together with some other folks, were, were together as like seminary classmates. And in the university together, they love God and they form a, a group called the Holy Club. They didn't name the name. I mean, it would have been, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, not presumptuous to name themselves that way. People call them that. So history records it as that. They gather at 4 a.m. in the morning to pray and seek God. And so everyone called them the Holy Club. They were members of quote unquote the Holy Club. Because no, no, every student wanted to sleep late. They get up at 4 to seek God. That was where the first great awakening was born. By the time the people see the great awakening, and there were tens of Thousands of people converted on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. USA and England that affected the whole world. It changed the world. History now records that the first great awakening changed all of society for good. It was born with a handful of people in prayer. This revival of the end time God is not looking for multitudes. He is looking for purity of heart. All he wants is a group of people who will be willing to give their all to Jesus, love him, and it is in our all night prayers that this move was born. Do you know when the Pergamos glory was? February the 9th. And every year, February the 9th, for 30 years, three decades, has always been the last day of the 40 day fast. You think that's a coincidence? No. By predestination. February the 9th, 2012, was the day Pergamos glory came down. Not many people know. But it was spread through the whole world. In the crucible of the field, God birthed the greatest move. You and those online here are privileged to be part of it. As lovers of God.
So combine the two principles. Worship, fasting. Fasting is just let go natural thing. Just your way. And you enter into this implication that is beyond. I love my Thursday's fast. I love my Friday fast. I love the all night prayers. When we fast, we pray, we seek God. Doesn't matter how long it takes. It only matters that it definitely will come. If you ask Noah building the ark, hey, how long? Eh? Why this big boat? Eh? I don't know. When are you going to move? Doesn't matter because you know it is going to come. And we know the shaking is coming. We know the Antichrist was born in 2015. We know false prophet was born in 2004. And we are here saying, Lord, here am I, send us. That's all we need to do. Worship God, fast and pray. The rest is walk in the works He prepared for us. If He prepared for you to do great signs and wonders, you just have to walk in that when the time comes. You don't have to feel that different. Why do you think that when you're healing 10,000 people, you must feel different? Even your hairstyle goes different. Like electricity flowing through your hair. <laughs> no, 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 you're still the same you. Let me ask you this question. When Peter was walking on water, when Jesus said, Come! When he stepped out of the boat and walked on water, did he have to walk on water different style? Just because it was water, he has to walk. Not slow much. No! Did he have to feel different? No! Did he need a supernatural character change? No! He just had to obey the word when the time comes. Correct? So when he says, Lord, if it is you, he says in Matthew 14, Call me to come to you. That means the Lord must give the permission. If the Lord didn't give permission, he goes out all his own effort. No, that's the end of him. And then he heard the voice. Come! Without thinking, without hesitation, without checking whether he's ready. He just stepped out and started walking. Like the normal way he used to walk. And he was walking on the water. Because we walk in the works he prepared. We will still be the simple folks, meek and humble, who just enjoy worshipping God, who enjoy loving God, and let God take all his glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, combine the two. And it will be a powerful thing. Let the Lord speak to you and lead you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you you have chosen the foolish to confound the wise. You have chosen the humble to confound the proud. You have chosen the rejected in uh, King David's time to become the mightiest army the kingdoms have ever seen. You have always chosen in such a manner that you will get the greatest glory. People will never expect you to use your use. People will expect to use you never touch them or go near them. You rejected the Eliabs and chosen the Davids. You rejected the Esau's, chosen the Jacobs and make them Israel. We thank you, Father, that you do all these things because humility is number one with you. You want all mankind to acknowledge there is only one true God. 
and there's only one Savior, and there's only one worship that is real to the true and living God. We are all made of clay, the clay of the earth, the elements of the earth. Our spirits came from you. We took on our souls because we are humankind. We choose to humble ourselves before you and declare ourselves as part of this end time move of the glorious bride. We thank you, Father, that you have chosen us. Not because of who we are. Not because of what we have done. But you have chosen us by your foreknowledge and predestination so that you can get the maximum glory through our lives. And we delight in you. We delight in the worship of Christ. We delight in the glory of Christ. To you be all glory, honor, power, riches, wisdom forever and ever. We worship you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all rise together. And the Lord bless you. The Lord strengthen your spirit that you may be able to seek Him. Seek Him. Ah, seek not. That you may be able to come face to face with Him. That your inner man will be strengthened. That Christ may dwell in fullness in your life and cause you to know the fullness of His predestination and His foreknowledge in your life. That you be a mighty army, a mighty part of the army of God, of the glorious church that will bring forth the kingdom of God to fullness on this planet earth and see the fullness of the manifestation of new Jerusalem glory in your lifetime. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I give you a good prayer. God bless you.